Today, I'm going to be talking about the future of data engineering, which is sort of a highfalutin fancy uh, title. So in actuality, what I want to cover is I want to give you a little bit of my con the context about me. Um, and I want to present some various stages of data pipeline maturity. I'm going to kind of uh, twist the blog post that, that uh, Gwen alluded to uh, a bit so that if you've already read it, uh, you'll still get something new. If you haven't read it, you'll also be getting something new. So lastly, what I want to do is build out um, kind of an architecture as we progress along through the stages so that we land on something that, in my view, is kind of uh, a modern data architecture, data pipeline, um, and also uh, maybe a little bit of hint of where I think we're going in the next couple years. So I'll get started with context. The reason I want to cover this in a little more detail than I might otherwise is because I think um, when I'm doing things like predicting the future or uh, telling you what, how I think things are going to be, it's important to know where I'm coming from so that you all can get a sense for uh, a little bit about my perspective and, and kind of uh, couch that with your own perspectives and sort of act accordingly. I also want to give you a little context about what I mean by data engineering. Because as it turns out, uh, that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, and lastly, I want to do a really brief uh, overview of just uh, why I'm giving this talk and what led to the blog post that, that Gwen had been talking about. Um, so my name is Chris. I work right now at WePay, which is a payment processing um, company. We're actually part of JP Morgan Chase at this point. We got acquired a few years ago. I work on data infrastructure there and data engineering. Uh, our stack is uh, Airflow, Kafka, and BigQuery for the most part. Airflow is, of course, a job scheduler that kicks off jobs and does uh, workflow kind of things. BigQuery is a data warehouse uh, hosted by Google Cloud. Now, you'll get a hint of this. I make a lot of, maybe not a lot, but I make some references to Google Cloud in here. You can definitely swap them out with corresponding AWS or Azure services for the most part. I think they can be drop in in the context of this talk. And lastly, uh, Kafka. Kafka is a big one. We, work, uh, we use it a lot at WePay. Um, and that kind of leads into my, my previous history at LinkedIn, where I spent about uh, seven years. Uh, LinkedIn was the birthplace of Kafka, which is, uh, for those of you that might not be aware, a uh, pub sub, uh, sort of write ahead log. Um, that's, uh, at this point, it's a, sort of the backbone of a distributed infrastructure around logging. Um, and while I was at LinkedIn, I spent a bunch of time doing everything from data science, service infrastructure, and so on. Um, I also wrote Apache SAMSA, which is a stream processing system. So I'm very interested to hear about the, uh, the Netflix stateful stream processing uh, talk that's on this track. Uh, I spent some time with Hadoop, more job schedulers, and more data warehouses at PayPal. So that's me. Um, when it comes to data engineering, there's all kinds of different definitions. I've seen people using it when they're talking about business analytics. I've seen people talk about it in the context of data science. Uh, so I, I'm gonna throw down my definition. Um, I'm gonna claim that a data engineer's job is to help an organization move and process data, right? So on the movement front, we're talking about either streaming pipelines or data pipelines. On the processing front, we're talking about data warehouses, stream processing. Usually we're focused uh, asynchronous uh, sort of batch or streaming based stuff as opposed to synchronous real time kind of things. Um, and I want to call it a keyword help here uh, because I think I'll tie this in at the end of the talk, so just bookmark that, that we're not actually, in my view, supposed to be moving and processing the data ourselves. We're supposed to be helping the organization do that. Um, so that was the what. This is a little bit of the how. Maxime uh, Beauchemin, for the, those of you that don't know, is um, sort of a prolific engineer. He started out, I think, at Yahoo, Facebook, Airbnb, Lyft, and over the course of his adventures wrote Airflow, which is the job scheduler that we use, uh, as well as a bunch of other companies. And he also wrote Superset. Uh, and in this blog post on the rise of the data engineer that he published a few years ago, he said that data engineers build tools, infrastructure, frameworks, and services, right? So um, this is sort of the how, how we go about moving and processing the data. So why am I giving this talk? Um, the reason that I kind of got down this path was I came across this blog post. Uh, it's from a company called Ada, and it's, it's a really nice blog post where they talk about um, their, their journey trying to set up a data warehouse. They were a company, I think they do virtual assistants. I actually don't know that much about the company. Um, but they had a MongoDB database, and they were starting to run up against the limits of it when it came to uh, reporting uh, and some ad hoc query things. 
Um, so eventually, they did some exploration and landed on using Apache Airflow and Redshift, which is, of course, AWS's data warehousing solution. Um, the thing that struck me about this post was how much it looked like this post. Um, the, this is a post that I wrote uh, about three years ago. Uh, when I landed at, at WePay, um, they didn't have much of a data warehouse, and so we got one up and running. And we went through almost the exact same exercise that Ada did. We did some evaluation and eventually landed on Airflow and BigQuery, which is Google Cloud's version of Redshift. Um, the striking thing about the post is that they're, they're so verbatim that the images showing the architectures are almost identical, and even the structure of the posts themselves, like what sections are in the post, are identical. So I thought this was, this was kind of interesting because, from my perspective, this was something we had done a few years ago. Um, and so I kind of threw down the gauntlet that, that I, I make the claim that I know if they are successful and want to continue building out their data warehouse, where they might end up. Um, and so I thought it might be useful to share some of those thoughts. And so I kind of made the claim that one step would be uh, going real time, going from batch to real time, and the next step might be going uh, to a fully self-serve or automated pipeline. And I want to be clear, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to pick on that particular blog post or anything. I think it's a perfectly, perfectly reasonable solution. Um, it just so happens that I think that there's a sort of a natural progression about uh, the evolution of a data pipeline and a data warehouse and sort of the modern data ecosystem. And that's really what I want to cover in the talk today. So I refined this a little bit, and I kind of got cute with it and tried to do a land expand on demand kind of thing. I was toying with like past, present, future, um, but trying to figure out how to ca categorize this, this stuff and these thoughts in a way that, that really resonated and made sense. Um, so the initial idea was, well, initially you land, you've got nothing, so you need to set up a data warehouse quickly. Then you expand, you start doing more integrations, maybe you go to real time because you've got Kafka in your ecosystem, and then finally you, you do an expansion where you, uh, or sorry, you do an automation where you start doing on-demand stuff. Um, that eventually led to this post uh, where, where I talked about three trends, or sorry, <laughs> four trends uh, that I see coming down the road. The first one is timeliness, where I see us going from this batch-based periodic architecture to a more real-time architecture. And uh, the second one is connectivity, where once you go down the timeliness route, uh, you start doing more integration with other systems. Uh, and then the last two, I think, kind of tie together automation and, and decentralization. On the automation front, I think we need to start uh, thinking about operating not just our operations, but our data management. And I'll go into that today. And then decentralizing the data warehouse as a total. So um, what I didn't do in that talk, or in that post, and what I want to do today is kind of put a hier hierarchy up in front of it. Um, and I'm kind of going to walk through these stages sequentially. And as I mentioned earlier, build out a little bit, bit of an architectural diagram so we can see where we end up. Uh, the reason I wanted to go down this path is I found as I was thinking about future, it was occurring to me everyone's future is different because you're all at a different point in your life cycle. You know, if you're ADA, your future looks very different than somebody like WePay where we're maybe farther along on some dimensions. And then there are companies that are even farther along than us. Um, so I think this kind of lets you choose your own adventure and build out a little bit of a, uh, a roadmap for yourself. So I'm going to start with the none stage. Uh, I wasn't sure what to call this. I couldn't think of anything clever. Um, but you're probably at this stage if you have no data warehouse. Uh, you've probably got a monolithic architecture, you're maybe a smaller company, uh, and you need a warehouse up and running like now. You probably also don't have too many data engineers, and so you're kind of doing this on the side. It looks like this. We're all familiar with our lovely monolith and our database, and, and this is where you take a user and you attach it to this. And this kind of sounds crazy to people that have been in the data warehouse world for a while, but it's actually a pretty viable solution uh, when you need to get things up and running. The latency of the data that the users are looking at is basically real time because you're querying the database. And uh, it's pretty easy and cheap. Um, and this is, this is actually where I landed at we, when I landed at WePay where they were at. So about 2014, when I joined, uh, we had a PHP monolith and basically a monolithic MySQL database. The users I had, though, weren't quite as happy. Um, and notice there's more than one of them there. <laughs> Um, so things were starting to tip over a little bit. Uh, we had queries timing out. We had users impacting each other. Most OLTP systems that you're going to be using are not going to be uh, 
fairly strong on the isolation front, so users can really get in each other's way. Uh, because we were using MySQL, it was missing some of the more fancy analytics SQL stuff that our data science and business analytics people wanted. And uh, report generation was starting to tip over, right? So a pretty, pretty normal story. There we go. Um, and so we started to go down the batch path. And this is where the uh, Ada post comes in and that earlier post I mentioned also comes in. So on this path, right, uh, you have a monolithic architecture probably. Um, you might be starting to trend away from that a little bit, but usually it works best when you have relatively few sources. Uh, data engineering is now probably your part-time job. You've got queries, as I mentioned, as we were suffering from that are timing out. You're exceeding the database capacity, so whether it's space, memory, uh, or CPU, you're starting to see queries just not come back. Um, I mentioned the complex analytics SQL stuff, and reports are becoming more and more of an issue for your organization. And those could be customer-facing reports or internal reports. And people are starting to ask for things like charts and business intelligence and all that kind of fun stuff. And that's where the classic you know, batch-based approach that, that I think most people uh, are familiar with comes in. In between the database and the user, you stuff a data warehouse uh, that can accomplish a lot more of the more OLAP and uh, you know, analysis kind of needs, analytic needs. And to get data from the database into that data warehouse, you have a scheduler that will periodically wake up and suck the data in. So that's where we were at maybe about 2016. This is probably about a year after I joined. Um, and this, this architecture is actually pretty fantastic uh, in terms of trade-offs. You can get the uh, pipeline up pretty quickly these days. Uh, at the time I did it in 2016, it took like a couple weeks. Um, the data latency we had was about 15 minutes, so we were doing incremental partition loads where we would take little chunks of data and load them in. Uh, and we could handle, we were running, I think, a few hundred tables. Um, and this actually, if you think back to that land expand on demand kind of hierarchy that I was attempting to impose, if you're just trying to get something up and running, this is a really nice place to, to start off with. Um, but of course, you outgrow it. Um, so at some point, the number of airflow workflows that we had you know, went from a few hundred to a few thousand. We started running tens or hundreds of thousands of uh, tasks per day. So that, the likelihood that all those are gonna work starts to not be that probable. Um, so that became a bit of an operational issue. We also discovered, and this is a little less intuitive to people that haven't actually run complex data pipelines, but you, in an incremental or batch-based approach, you start having to impose dependencies uh, on the schemas or requirements on the schemas of the data that you're loading. So we had issues with create times and modify times and ORMs doing things in different ways, and, and it got a little complicated for us. Uh, DBAs were impacting our workload, so if they do something that, that kind of hurts our, our replica, uh, that we were reading off of, it can cause latency issues, which can in, in turn cause us to miss data. Hard deletes weren't being propagated, and this is a big one. If you have people that uh, delete data from your database, this is you know, something that I think most people don't want to do, but most people do do, um, whether it's removing in a row or a table or whatever it is, that can cause problems with batch loads as well, because you just don't know when the data disappears. Uh, latency I mentioned, and, and of course, more timeouts. This time the timeouts are happening on your workflow though. Now this is where uh, real time kicks off. And this is where I'm gonna maybe go a little more in depth than I have over the first two stages, because I think now we're approaching sort of what I would consider uh, the cusp or the modern era of uh, real time data architecture. So you might be ready for this. If uh, your load times are taking too long, You've got uh, pipelines that are no longer stable, whether that's workflows being uh, failing or MySQL or whatever your RDBMS is having issues uh, serving the data. You've got complicated workflows. Um, data, lat data latency is, is becoming a bigger problem. And what I mean here is essentially, you know, maybe the 15 minute jobs you started off with in, in 2014 or 2016 are now taking an hour or a day and uh, people that are using it aren't, aren't as happy about it. Um, data engineering now is probably your full-time job, right? Uh, and lastly, you, you look around the ecosystem, you, are, uh, no, you might have something like Apache Kafka in your back pocket. Maybe the operations folks have spun it up to do log aggregation and, and run some operational metrics over it. Maybe some web services are communicating uh, via uh, Kafka to do some queuing or asynchronous processing. Uh, it's probably you know, floating around in your ecosystem at this point. So, 
uh, from a data pipeline perspective, what we're going to do is, is get rid of that um, batch processor for ETL purposes and replace it with a streaming platform, right? Um, and so that's what we did. We wrote up a post where we, we got rid of, uh, well, I shouldn't say we got rid of Airflow, but we changed our ETL pipeline from um, Airflow to Debezium and a few other systems. So it started to look uh, a little bit like this. And so this is where we were in about 2017. Um, we introduced, so you can see the, air, the, the little Airflow box now has uh, one, two, three, four, f five boxes in it, and we're talking about many machines. So the operational complexity has gone up, but in exchange for that, we've got a real-time pipeline now. So we've got uh, Kafka, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail about what that is. Um, I will do a very brief overview, which is that it is a write-ahead log that you can use uh, to either produce messages to, they get appended to the end of the log, and you can have consumers that are reading from various locations in that log. So it's a sequential read and sequential write kind of a thing. Um, we use it uh, with these connectors. So it has this ecosystem and this framework called Kafka Connect. One of the connectors we're a heavy user of is Debezium. So this is a change data capture connector that reads data from MySQL in real time and funnels it into Kafka, also in real time. And I said a magic word there that, that actually may not be familiar to many people here, but change data capture is um, essentially a way to replicate data from one data source to others. Wiki's, Wikipedia's got this nice little write-up where they're, they're talking about the identification, capture, and delivery of changes made to the enterprise data sources. Sounds very fancy. But to give you a concrete example, um, what something like Debezium will do is if I have, a, in our case, a MySQL database, and I insert a row, and then maybe I update that row, and at some future time, I delete it. The CDC feed, change data capture feed, will give me uh, three different events, an insert, the update, and the delete. And in some cases, it'll actually give me the before and the after. So if an update occurs, it'll show what it was like before and then what, it was like, uh, what the row looked like after. Um, so you can imagine this can be kind of useful if you're building out a data warehouse, right? Um, so Debezium's got a bunch of sources. We use MySQL, as I mentioned. Now, again, if you think back to that ADA post I referenced at the beginning of this talk, one of the things about that post that caught my eye was the fact that they were using MongoDB. And sure enough, uh, Debezium has a MongoDB connector. Uh, I should also call out uh, Cassandra is something that I'll be talking a little bit about in the, the later portions of this talk. It's a connector that we contributed to Debezium just a couple months ago. Uh, it's incubating, and we're still getting up off the ground with it ourselves, but uh, that's something that we're, we're going to be using pretty heavily in the near future. Lastly, quick shout out for the data track. This is Gunnar right up here in the front row. He's going to be talking later today. So if you guys are interested in Debezium more, uh, you should definitely come to his talk. OK, back to our pipeline. Last but not least, we have KCBQ, which stands for Kafka Connect BigQuery. I do not name things creatively. Um, so this is just a connector that takes data from Kafka and loads it into BigQuery. The cool thing about this, though, is that uh, it leverages BigQuery's real-time streaming insert API. So when you think about most data warehouses, they tend to be more batch load because they're just assuming that you're going to be doing batch, uh, batch load. So going to back, back to my LinkedIn days, HDFS at the time was all batch-based. We had actually MapReduce tasks that would spin up, read from Kafka since the last time they ran, and then load them into HDFS and then shut down again. And they would do this periodically. Even though the Kafka feed was real-time, HDFS was just not set up for it at that time. One of the cool things about BigQuery is it has basically a RESTful API you can use to post uh, data into uh, the data warehouse in real time, and it's visible almost immediately. So what that gives us is a data warehouse uh, where the latency from our production database to our data warehouse is about five seconds, give or take. It's actually a little less, usually more like a, a couple seconds. Um, and, and this pattern really opens up a lot of use cases. So first off, it lets you do real-time uh, metrics and business intelligence uh, off of your data warehouse. Uh, it also allows you to do debugging, which is something that's not immediately obvious, but um, if your engineers need to see the state of their database in production right now, uh, being able to go the, to the data warehouse to do that is actually a pretty nice way uh, to, to, to expose that state to them so that they can figure out what's going on with their system. And the fact that they're seeing a real-time, you know, within five-second uh, view of that world is, is pretty handy. Uh, and lastly, you can do some kind of fancy mo monitoring stuff with it. Uh, you can start to impose uh, sort of assertions about what the shape of the data should look like in the database so that not only do you know that the data warehouse is healthy, but that the underlying uh, web service itself might be 
healthy. And there are, of course, some problems with this. Uh, not all of our connectors at that point in time when we first did the migration were on this pipeline. So we're now sort of in this world where we have the new cool stuff and the, the old, older painful stuff. Data Store is a Google Cloud system that we were using that was still Airflow-based. Cassandra, as I mentioned, didn't have a connector, really. Uh, and Bigtable, which is a Google Cloud-hosted version, I hate to say version, but uh, of HTable or HBase. Uh, so we use all these systems as well, right? Um, in addition to that, we've got BigQuery, but BigQuery needed more than just our primary OLTP data. It needed logging and metrics. We had Elasticsearch in the mix now, and we've got this fancy graph database that we're going to be open sourcing soon that uh, needs data as well. So, so the, the ecosystem starts looking more complicated, right? So we're no longer talking about this little monolithic database. Uh, huge hat tip to Confluent for, uh, for the image here. I think it's pretty accurate. Um, so this is tough. Uh, we have to start figuring out how to managing some of this operational pain. Uh, and one of the first things you can do is start to do uh, some integration so that you have fewer systems to, to deal with here. And for us, we, we leverage Kafka for that. So you might be ready for data integration. And really, this is, uh, if you think back 20 years to sort of like enterprise service bus uh, architectures, that's really all this is in a nutshell. The only difference is that um, Platforms and streaming platforms like Kafka, along with um, sort of the evolution in stream processing that's happened over the last 10 years or so, has made this really viable. Uh, so you might be ready if you've got a lot of microservices, you've got a diverse set of databases, as I showed in that last picture. You've got uh, some specialized derived data systems. So I mentioned graph databases, but you may have special caches. You might have a real-time OLAP system. Uh, and you've got maybe a team of data engineers now, uh, enough people that are responsible that uh, they can start to, to manage some of this complex workload. And lastly, hopefully you've got a, a, a really happy, mature SRE organization that's more than willing to take on uh, all these connectors for you. Um, so this is what it looks like. You'll see we've still got sort of the, the base data pipeline that we've had so far. We've got a, a service with a DB, we've got our streaming platform, and we've got our data warehouse. But now we've got the web services. Maybe we've got a NoSQL thing, or we've got this new SQL thing. Um, we've got a graph database there. And then I've also got some, uh, some search diagram there to plug it in. This is an example. Um, in our case, a concrete instance of this would be around where we were at the beginning of the year. Right? So things are getting even more complicated now. Now we've got not Debezium connected not only to MySQL, but we've got it connected to Cassandra as well. Um, highlight that. Uh, and, and this is, as I mentioned previously, uh, the connector that we've been working with, with Gunnar and company on to try and get it off the ground. You'll see down in the, the bottom there, we've also got uh, KCW, which is, uh, stands for Kafka Connect Waltz. So Waltz is, is a sort of uh, ledger that we've built in-house that's kind of Kafka-ish in some ways and kind of more like a database in some ways, but it, it services our um, our ledger use cases and our ledger needs because we are a payment processing system. Um, we care a lot about data transactionality and multi-region availability. And so it's sort of a, a quorum-based write-ahead log that handles serializable transactions. And on the downstream side, as I mentioned, we've got a bunch of this stuff going on, right? So, so why, why are we incurring all this pain? Why are there so many boxes? This is getting more and more complicated, right? The answer uh, has to do with Metcalfe's law. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm going to uh, paraphrase, paraphrase and probably corrupt it quite a bit. But essentially what it is is a, a statement that the value of a network increases the more nodes and connections you add to it. Um, it's usually used in the context of social networking, where people are always talking about adding more nodes and edges. But um, it was initially actually intended to be used for uh, communication devices. So adding more peripherals to an Ethernet network is, is what the Wikipedia page said. So um, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about getting to a network effect in our data ecosystem. This leads me to uh, a post, yet another This is like plugging all my blog posts. Uh, this is another post that I wrote uh, earlier in the year where I kind of thought through the implications of Kafka as your escape hatch. So when you leverage this kind of network effect in the data ecosystem, uh, what, you're, what you're doing is adding more and more systems to the Kafka bus um, that are now able to load their data in and expose it to other systems and slurp up the data of those systems. So we found this to be a pretty powerful architecture uh, because your data becomes really portable. Uh, and, and so it leads to some advantages. First off, 
uh, I'm not going to say it lets you avoid vendor lock-in, but at least ameliorates some of those concerns because if your data is portable, um, usually that's kind of the harder part to, to, to deal with when you're moving uh, between systems. And so the idea that you could say, if you're on Splunk, plug in Elasticsearch alongside it uh, to test it out uh, suddenly becomes theoretically possible. It, it, the, the, the cost to do so certainly gets lowered. Um, it also helps with multi-cloud strategy. So if you you know, need to run on multiple clouds because you need really high availability or, want, you know, again, want to just be able to pit the cloud vendors against each other to save money, uh, you can do that. Uh, and you can move, use Kafka and the Kafka bus as a way to, to move the, the data around. And lastly, uh, I think it leads to infrastructure agility. I kind of alluded to this with my Elasticsearch example, but if you come across some new you know, hot real-time OLAP system that you want to check out or you know, some new cache that you want to plug in, the fact that your data is already in uh, your streaming platform, your, your Kafka, uh, means that all you really need to do is turn on the new system and plug in a sync for it to, to load the data and you can at least start to get a feel for how the system is going to behave and how the pipeline might behave. So, so it drastically lowers the cost of testing the water with new things and spe uh, supporting specialized infrastructure. So these are things that maybe do one or two things really well um, that normally you might have to kind of decide on a trade-off between operationally, do we want to support this specialized piece of infrastructure, um, like a graph database, or do we want to use an RDBMS, which just so happens to have joins? Um, and so it, it, by reducing the cost, you can start to get a, a little bit of a more granular uh, set of uh, infrastructure to handle your queries. Now, the problems here look a little different, right? Um, what we found ourselves doing when we moved to this architecture and sort of bought in and did a bunch of the uh, integration was um, we, we were still spending a lot of time doing fairly manual stuff. So adding channels for MySQL DBs, adding you know, topics for Kafka, setting up Debezium connectors, creating data sets. You, know, I mean, you can read the, the whole list here, right? Um, and you know, in short, we were, we were spending a lot of time administering the, the, the data the the systems around the streaming platform. So a lot of the connectors, the upstream databases, the downstream data warehouses. And our ticket load started to go something like this. So these are, this is a screenshot, for those of you that are huge fans of JIRA, you, you might recognize this. Uh, this is a screenshot of our uh, support load um, in JIRA over the past 300 days or so. And you can see it's like kind of happy at the beginning of the year, it's relatively low. And then like around May or March, it's kind of skyrockets and it hasn't ever really fully recovered. Um, although, there's a nice trend over the last couple months that I'll get into right now. Um, we started investing in automation, right? Uh, and, and this is something you've got to do when, you're, when your system gets so big. It's kind of a no-duh thing. I think most people would say, well, yeah, you should have been automating all along, right? Uh, that's, that's like table stakes. Um, so you might be uh, ready for this step if your SREs can't keep up. Uh, you're spending a lot of time on manual toil, and I'll get into what I mean by toil a little bit. Uh, and you don't have time for the fun stuff. So I want to add two new layers here. Um, the first one, as I mentioned, is the aut automation of operations. And this is something, like I said, that most people are going to not be too surprised about. You know, whether it's, it's just the DevOps stuff has been going on for a long time. I think a lot of people are very familiar with it. But there's a second layer in here that I don't think is quite as obvious, uh, and that is the uh, data management automation layer. Um, so I'm going to go into both of these now. So first off, we'll cover automation uh, for operations. I'll do that relatively quickly because I, I don't think there's a ton of new ground to cover here. But um, there's a great quote from uh, Google SRE Handbook where I think the chapter is actually on toil. Uh, and they define toil as like manual, repeatable, automatable stuff. It's usually interrupt driven. So you're getting slacks or tickets or people are showing up at your desk asking you to do things. Uh, and they're saying, if a human operator needs to touch your system during normal operations, you have a bug, right? That is not what you want to be doing. And so what are normal operations for data engineering? Well, it's all the stuff we were spending our time on, right? Uh, it's, it's all this, like, anytime you're adding, managing a pipeline, you're going to be adding new topics and adding new data sets and setting up views and granting access. This stuff needs to get automated. So great news. There's a bunch of solutions for this, right? Terraform, Ansible, on and on. I saw. Uh, um, there was a good talk on Terraform yesterday from one of my old coworkers, uh, but uh, 
anyhow, uh, we at WePay use Terraform and Ansible. Um, but like I said, you can substitute any one of these out if you want to. And it doesn't look terribly surprising. You can use it to manage your topics, right? Here's an example where you've got some system D log thing where you're logging some stuff and you're using compaction, uh, which is kind of an exciting policy to use with your system D logs, but I'll, I'll digress. Um, and you can also manage your Kafka Connect connectors. Um, these are like the Debezium's and the KCBQ's and the KCW's of the world. So not terribly surprising. We should be doing this. But we, we kind of are doing this, right? So we have Terraform. We've had Ansible for a long time. We're, we're moving now to Terraform and Packable and more Packer and more Immutable deploys. But long story short, we, we've got a bunch of operational tooling. We're fancy and we're on the cloud. And uh, we have um, a bunch of scripts that we use to manage BigQuery uh, and automate a lot of our, our, what I would call, toil. Um, things like creating views and BigQuery, creating data sets, and so on. So why, why are we still having such a high ticket load? Uh, and the answer is we are spending a lot of time on, or we were spending a lot of time on data management. So we were answering questions like these. Well, who, who's going to get access to this data once I load it? You know, how, how, long, how long am I allowed to keep this data? Hey, security, is it OK to, to persist this data indefinitely, or do we need to have a three-year truncation policy? Uh, is the data allowed in the system, even? Um, you know, again, WePay is sort of a, uh, um, a payment processor, so we deal with some pretty sensitive information. Um, you know, what geography can it be in? And, you know, should, should there be certain columns that get stripped out, redacted? You know, stuff like that. Uh, so, as I mentioned, I think WePay, I won't say we're on the forefront of this, but we certainly deal not necessarily with regulation, but with policy and compliance stuff. We have a fairly robust compliance arm that's part of J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, in addition to that, because we deal with credit cards, we have PCI audits and we deal with uh, you know, credit card data. Um, so we, we really need to think about this. And I, I don't think we're alone. And I think this is going to become just more and more of a theme. So get used to it. Like We're going to have to start uh, doing a lot of this stuff. And I just that's the, the reality of the situation. Um, I think you know, if you're in Europe, you're talking about GDPR, CCPA is for California, we have PCI if you've got credit card data, HIPAA for health, SOX is if you're public, SHIELD is one I didn't even know about, but apparently that's in New York. Um, on and on and on, right? So, so we're going to have to really start uh, getting better at automating this stuff, or else our, whole, our, our lives as data engineers is mostly just going to be spent chasing people around trying to make sure this stuff is compliant. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about what I think that might look like. And now I'm kind of getting into the more futuristic stuff. And so things might get a little more vague or hand wavy, but I'll, I'm trying to keep it as concrete as I can. Um, first thing you want to do is probably set up a data catalog. This is something that over the past year or two, I've seen a lot of activity in. Um, a data catalog, and I, I should mention, you, you probably want it centralized, i.e. you want to have one with, with uh, all the metadata. It's going to have the locations of your data, what kind of schemas the data has, who owns the data, lineage, which is essentially where the data came from. So in my you know, initial examples, it would be like it came from MySQL, it went to Kafka, and then it got loaded into to BigQuery, knowing that whole pipeline. Uh, maybe even encryption or versioning, so you know uh, what, what things are masked or encrypted and what things are, are uh, versioned as, as the schemas evolve. So I'm going to do a big shout out to uh, Amundsen, which is a, a data catalog from Lyft. But I should be clear, there's like a bunch of these. This there's a bunch of activity in this area. It's kind of getting very hot, I think, over the last year. So you have Apache Atlas. Uh, you have Data Hub, which was recently kind of open sourced as a patch. Uh, that's from LinkedIn. WeWork has a system called Marquez. Google has a product called uh, Data Catalog. Uh, and, and I know I'm, I'm missing you know, at least two or three more from this list. Um, now, what these things do, they, they generally do a lot, and they generally do more than one thing. Uh, but I wanted to show an example just to kind of make it concrete. So we've got uh, an example here with some fake data that I, I yanked from the Munson blog uh, where they, um, they've got the schema, you know, the field types, the data types, everything. They've got who owns the data, right? And notice that add button there. Uh, I want to get back to that in a moment, um, but just keep that in the back of your mind. We've got the source, so this is kind of starting to get into a little bit of the lineage. So um, it's telling you what, what source code generated it, what system generated it. In this case, it's Airflow. That's what that little pinwheel is. And uh, you know some lineage about where that data came from. And they've even got a little preview. Uh, it's a pretty nice UI. 
Um, and underneath it, of course, is a repository. And you, I think you can even use uh, Apache Atlas uh, to power it or Neo4j, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that actually houses all this information. And that's, that's really useful uh, because you need to get all your systems to be talking to this, this catalog, right? So that little plus thing that I mentioned on the, the owner part, you don't, as a data engineer, want to be entering that data in yourself. That is not where you want to be. That's sort of back in land of manual data steward, data uh, management. Um, instead, what you want to be doing is hooking up all these systems to your data catalog so that they're automatically reporting stuff um, you know, about the schema, about the evolution of the schema, about the ownership, uh, when the data is loaded from one to the next. Uh, so you know, first off, you need your systems like Airflow and BigQuery, your data warehouses and stuff, to talk to data catalog. Um, I think there's quite a bit of movement there. Uh, you then need your data pipeline streaming platforms to talk to your data catalog. I think that there's, uh, I haven't seen as much uh, yet from that area, although uh, maybe, maybe there's uh, stuff coming out that will integrate better. But right now, I think that's kind of something you gotta do on your own. Um, and then something that I, I, I don't think we've done a really good job of bridging the gap with is on that service side. I, you actually, I will claim, want to have uh, your service uh, stuff in the data catalog as well. So this would be like gRPC protobufs. It would be JSON schemas uh, and even the, the DBs of those databases, right? So once you've got your, um, you know where all your data is, the next step is you've got to configure your access to it. And right now, like, like I said, if you haven't automated this stuff, what you're probably doing is, is going to security or your compliance or whoever the policymaker is and being like, can so-and-so see this data whenever they make an access request? And that's not where you want to be. You want to be able to automate the access request management so that you don't have to, you can be as hands-off with it as, as possible. So this is kind of alphabet soup. What we're really talking about here is our back role based access controls, identity access management, access control lists, just a bunch of uh, fancy words for a, a bunch of different features for managing uh, groups, user access, and so on. Um, so you kind of need three things to do this. The first thing is you need your systems to support it. The second thing is you need uh, to provide some tooling to security and compliance to configure the policies appropriately. And the third thing is you need to automate uh, the management of the policies once they've been defined by your security and compliance folks. Um, so I'm going to start with some good news, and that is that uh, I think there's been a fair amount of work done on a lot of the uh, system supporting it aspect of this. Airflow has RBAC, which is a uh, role-based access control. It was a patch we submitted last year from WePay. I think Kafka has had... Uh, and I should mention Airflow has had a lot more work done on it since then. They now have DAG-level access control. And they, they've, they've really taken it pretty seriously. Um, Kafka also has ACLs and has had that for quite a while. Um, and here's an example of managing it with Terraform. Um, so you can use those kind of tools to start to automate some of this stuff. Um, so we want to be automating when a new user is added to the system, their access automatically gets configured. When a new, user, when a new piece of data is added to the system, their uh, access controls automatically get configured. We want to start automating service account access, so as new web services are coming online. Uh, and the last two are, are less obvious. Uh, there's occasionally need for someone to get temporary access to something, and you don't want to be in a position where you're setting a calendar reminder three, years, or th three weeks in the future to say, hey, please remember to revoke the access for this user. You want that all to be automated. Um, and same deal with unused access. You want to know when users aren't using all the permissions that they're granted so that you can start to strip them away to kind of limit the, the uh, security vulnerability space. So once we've got, uh, we know where all our data is and we know we've got the policies uh, set up, we need to detect violations, and this, this area of my talk is a little thin. I mostly want to talk about data loss prevention, but there's also auditing as well, which is you know, keeping track of logs and making sure that the activities and the systems are conforming to uh, the uh, required policies. <clears throat> so uh, we need to monitor and verify that uh, the policies aren't being violated. So I'm going to pick out, uh, because I'm in Google Cloud and I have some experience with this piece of software, uh, the data loss solution from GCP. Um, there's a corresponding one from AWS called Macy. Uh, there's also an open source project called Ranger, which has uh, Apache Ranger, which has a little bit of an enforcement and monitoring mechanism built into it. It's more focused on the Hadoop ecosystem. The theme with all these things, though, is that um, you, can, you can use them to detect uh, sensitive data where it shouldn't be. 
So this is an example where you know, we've got a piece of text that says my phone number is blah, 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 and uh, you, you get a result back saying it defect detected an info type of phone number and the likelihood is very likely. Um, so you can use this kind of stuff uh, to start to monitor the policies that you set forth. So for example, if you have, say, a data set that is supposed to be clean, i.e. not have any sensitive information in it, you can run DLP checks on that uh, clean data set. And if anything pops up like a phone number or social security number or credit card, you can be alerted you know, immediately that, that there's a, um, a violation in place. <clears throat> Okay, so we, we have a little bit of progress here, right? Users can find the data that they need. They can use their data catalog. We have some automation in place. Maybe we're using Terraform to manage ACLs for Kafka. Maybe we're using Terraform to manage RBAC controls and Airflow. Um, but there's still a problem here. The problem is uh, data engineering is probably still the one managing that configuration in those deployments. And the reason for that is mostly due to the interface, right? So we're still in the land at this point of Git, pull requests, Terraform, DSL, YAML, JSON, you know, Kubernetes, it, it's, it's sort of nitty gritty. Um, so even going to some security teams might be a tall order and asking them to, uh, to make changes to that. Going to your compliance wing is an even taller order and going beyond compliance is basically like, there's no way. Um, so this, this leads to the last theme uh, or stage that I wanna talk about uh, and that is decentralization. So you're probably ready to decentralize your, your data pipeline and your data warehouses if you have a fully automated real-time data pipeline, but people are still coming to you uh, asking to get data loaded. That's a hint that you probably have, uh, you're probably ready for this step. So right, the question is, if everything's automated, why, why do we need a single team to manage all this stuff? Um, I, of course, don't think you do. Uh, I think the, the place where we're gonna see this first, and are, we're already seeing this in some ways, is a decentralization of the data warehouse. So uh, I think we're moving towards a world where people are going to be empowered to spin up um, multiple data warehouses and, and sort of administer and manage their own. Um, so the way I kind of frame this, this line of thought is really around our migration from monolith to microservices that we've had uh, going on you know, in the past decade or two. Um, and part of the motivation there was really to sort of break up large complex things, increase agility, increase efficiency, let people move at their own pace. A lot of that stuff kind of sounds like your data warehouse. It's like monolithic. Uh, it's not that agile. You're having to go to your data engineering team to ask to do things. Uh, you maybe don't want to. Maybe you're not able to do things at your own pace. So I think we're going to want to do the same kind of thing, and we're going to want to get towards a more de decentralized approach. Quick shout out. I'm not alone in this. There's a really great blog post. This was just like when I read this post, I was like, yes, this is exactly what I've I've been thinking about, and this is like just such a great description of it. And it turns out that that uh, the author of this blog post, uh, I'm probably gonna mispronounce her name, but Jamek Dagani, she is the next speaker in this track right after me, so I'm very excited to hear what she has to say. But in the post, she kind of talks about um, you know, the, the shift from this monolithic view to a more uh, fragmented or decentralized view, and she even talks about policy automation and a lot of the same stuff that I'm thinking about. Um, so I think this, this shift towards decentralization will take place in two phases. If you've got this set of raw tools, you've got your Git and your YAML and your JSON, and you're like this beaten down data engineering team that's just getting requests left and right, and you know, you're just running scripts all the time. If you're just trying to escape that, the first step is simply to expose that raw set of tools to your other engineers. They're comfortable with this stuff. They know Git, they know pull requests, they know YAML and JSON and all that kind of thing. So you can at least start exposing uh, the, the automated tooling and pipelines to those teams so that they can begin to manage their own data warehouses. So uh, an example of this uh, would be maybe you've got a team that does a lot of reporting or reconciliation uh, and you need to, uh, they need a data warehouse that they can manage. You might just give them you know, keys to the castle and they can, they can go about it. Maybe there's a team that's attached to your sales organization that's a business analytics team and they need to have a data warehouse, they can, they can do it as well. Um, but this is not, I think, the end goal. The end goal is full decentralization. And for that, I, I think what we really need to see here is a lot of uh, 
development and evolution in the tooling that we're providing beyond just sort of the gits and the yamls and the RTFM attitude that, that we kind of throw around sometimes. Um, so I'm talking here more about UIs, something that's polished, something that you can give not just to an engineer with 10 years under their belt, you know, writing code, but uh, to people outside of that uh, in your organization. So if we can get to that point, I think we will have uh, a, a fully decentralized warehouse and data pipeline where security and compliance can manage access controls, data engineering can manage the tooling uh, and the infrastructure. If you think all the way back to the beginning of this talk was really what Maxime was, was talking about. Uh, and everyone else can manage their own data pipelines and their own data warehouses and we can help them do that, which is that, that key phrase that I wanted to call out at the beginning of this talk. So with that, um, this is sort of where I landed on my view of a modern data architecture. Uh, we got real-time data integration, streaming platform, we've got automated data management, we have automated operations, uh, decentralized data warehouses and pipelines, and happy engineers, SREs, and users. Whew, okay. So when I started, Gwen, it was like uh, 97 slides, that's ambitious, so I made it. Um, Thank you all for, for attending the talk. I really appreciate you giving me your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you, you all might have. And of course, we're hiring as well, so if you want to come work on this stuff, let me know. Hi. Um, with, uh, here. Here. Hi, hey, um, with all of the loading, um, and, and I'm new to this space, so if this is like an elementary question, sorry. Um, but with all the loading of like low-level data that's in these like online transactional system databases, are you concerned about coupling to that data all at all? And do you think any of our reporting and analytics should move to the APIs of these services that they expose to other consumers? Dude, that is such a uh, fantastic question. I'm gonna call out another blog post that I have. <laughs> there, there's a blog post that I wrote earlier in the year called uh, Change Data Capture uh, Breaks Database Encapsulation or Microservice Encapsulation, and it is exactly what you're talking about. That is a problem. Um, in the post, I kind of enumerated the various strategies that you can uh, employ, and they can vary from the draconian, like uh, banning backwards and forwards compatibility changes on the microservice database, to more flexible things where you might put a streaming uh, shim in between that's, that's allowing the uh, team that owns the microservice to, to munge their data before it gets exposed to the public. I think Gunnar also has a really good post on an outbox pattern uh, that he, he talks about with Debezium. Um, so yes, absolutely a problem, something you've got to deal with. Um, I think we're headed towards a world where we are going to provide a data API much like the public facing API that the microservices expose. And I think we're gonna to have to handle, uh, I mean, these problems exist for the microservice APIs as well. You're talking about versioning, you're talking about migrating the users from one version to another and so on. The tooling is a little more nascent, but it is there, like the, the rudimentary parts, whether it's stream processing or schema management and detection, like that stuff is there, but it, it's a little more painful. Um, Uh-oh, Sid. <laughs> um, yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit about on uh, how you handle uh, historical data in case, for example, when you have, you have, you found out that uh, there is some defect that seeped into the data warehouse, the year, year's worth of data, and yep. you have to recalculate from yep. scratch. Yep. So that is a, also an excellent question. Um, the way that we handle that right now uh, there are a couple ways. So one is sort of a manual, like we will just in the data warehouse go and munge the thing to make it look like the upstream thing, and that's that's painful and you know not really rigorous in the sense that it may, you may make a mistake. Um, the other way is more more lazy and, and a little bit slower usually, but is more accurate, and that is we will uh, what we call rebootstrap or resnapshot the data. Um, so specifically uh, for us with Debezium, um, when you first start the connector up, obviously there's no data in Kafka yet, but that table might have existed for two years. So Debezium will do sort of a consistent snapshot where it will select all the data out and then load it into Kafka. Um, if you decide that something went wrong, you can essentially re-trigger and uh, uh, re-snapshot the thing again. And, uh, I'm getting a stop sign here. <laughs> uh, I, I can talk more with you later, but we, we usually re-snapshot. Yeah. I'm not sure, am I supposed to stop? 
Uh, excellent talk. Uh, thank you for uh, providing this amazing framework to understand you know, the challenges in data engineering. Um, I think a sign of good talk is that it launches a lot of conversations. And I'm sure you'll get a lot of questions from people here. Um, I have many, but I'll ask one or two. Um, one has to do with uh, data quality and data ownership. I think there's always this question of publishers of data, subscribers of data, who owns the data. Yep. It's, so, uh, how do you tackle that? Yeah, problem? yeah. So, so uh, we, so I'm a firm believer that the publisher should own it, and that's coming from a data engineer. <laughs> um, so at WePay, we take the stance that we are responsible for taking the data from the upstream database and making it look identical in the, the, the data pipeline. And so if it looks identical, we've done our job. Um, I think as we decentralize, the ownership is going to have to shift uh, to either the engineering teams or, or whomever. Um, and so then it becomes about detection, right, when things aren't matching up, alerting the proper people. Um, so we have some systems that we employ that do data quality checking at WePay. Right now, all those alerts come to us, and then we have to suss out. The problem we have is, and I think this is true of a lot of data engineering, is they don't necessarily have as much context around uh, like the business case, like what the data is. They're just kind of moving the data around. So we usually end up having to chase people down. Um, so my opinion is, if we go with like the microservice example, that um, if the pipeline is accurately moving the data and reflecting what is in the source database, then data engineering is doing its job. Usually, uh, the problem is not in that pipeline. It's like there's a confusion about the semantic meaning of a column, or there was a schema change upstream that affected the downstream users in a way that they're not happy about, or they're stuffing JSON into a string and they've stopped at it using a field that they were using, and that stuff we just push. It's, that's, that's on the uh, individual engineering teams to own. Okay, we're kind of out of time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> and you're welcome to stay here for Jean-Marc Degani's talk.